Okay, you're good to go. Ready to go? Welcome everybody. Um, okay, I won't say. Yeah, I'm visiting the dentist. <laughs> I'm sorry about the noise. Hopefully it will cease soon. Can we open with a word of prayer? Where's twice with any people? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving watch care over us. We pray that you would guide and direct us. You in all that we do and all that we say. Guide our thoughts and our feelings this evening. As we meditate upon your word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. In our studies at this camp meeting, we have been studying the transition from looking at things in the negative to looking at things in the positive. And we've actually defined those two concepts as two schools of theological thought. We have them on the board and we've gone over them a number of times now. So I'm hoping that people are now familiar and comfortable with these terms. I had a number of reasons why I wanted to introduce those terms and speak about things from this perspective. First of all, I wanted to show us that God has been leading us step by step. The second thing I wanted to do was to explain our history, the steps that we have taken. Using a new term, but integrating that into terms that you're familiar with. So 
So on the board you can see John and Jesus. You can see the Sabbath and marriage. You can see the four commandments and the six commandments. These are all repeating themes. And we should be able to look at our history from these different perspectives. And the more we can see things, I'll call it in these three dimensions. It's my hope that the more confidence we will have in the message that we have. That there is nothing new under the sun. So when we first began, you probably thought, why talk about these issues? What, why introduce Latin and Greek terms? What purpose do they serve? At least one of the reasons why I have introduced these terms and in recent, pre in recent camp meetings, other terms is to try to show you that what we are doing is going back over standard theological ideas. Ideas that Christians have been grappling with for millennia. These are not just crazy random ideas that we are coming up with today. So when we are challenging existing thoughts and ideas, and it looks like we are in a headlong collision with the spirit of prophecy, in fact, what is happening is that we're following a tradition of Christianity. Now, it's not the only person, but the one that you might think does this often is the champion of challenging existing dogma is Paul. I'm hoping that you know in your own studies and have listened to studies that I've done in the past where Paul has gone into the Old Testament and turn things upside down. Takes Old Testament scriptures and manipulates them for his own use. And what you have to ask yourself is, why do you find those things acceptable? And then we come to Ellen White. Ellen White has not such a strong habit as Paul, but she does the same thing. She'll take Bible verses and apply them in a literal fashion. Or she'll apply them in a way that I'm going to say suits herself. 
And what's your response to that? And If you were a Protestant today, you would say it's evidence that she's a false prophet. If you're an Adventist, you'll see that it's you'll say that it's evidence that she is a prophet. That she's clarifying the word of God for us, simplifying it. And here we are now. Turning things upside down. When Ellen White says you can't time set, we say you can. When she says it's good that women don't vote, we say that's wrong. When she says mixed marriages are not good, we say that's crazy. We can go on and on. And if you start considering some of her ideas about sexuality, which were all based upon, I'm just going to call it false science, but if we were going to be objective, we would say upon craziness. And we reject them. We've already discussed the subject of masturbation as an example. Where Ella White, who is just parroting the crazy doctors of her time, not just doctors, Christian doctors, who had themselves had a warped understanding of inspiration and said that masturbation will make you go mad or blind or weak. That it destroys this, this um, spiritual idea of vitality. We know all of those things are wrong. And it scares people to confront inspiration in the way that we are doing. Now the dilemma that we are faced with, that you are faced with, is how do you walk this fine line? Do you completely reject Helen White and portions of inspiration because they do not fit in with our current understanding of truth. Or do we try to understand those statements in their context? And this difficulty is causing this movement heartache and pain. There are what I would call the old guard still remaining amongst us. Those who are still trying to protect inspiration. Protect inspiration from people like myself. 
Kutingi di lama nembo ukutirisha pofe kubantu wa paranga wa pamini. He seemed to want to go in and attack. And what I wanted us to see is this is not some random fight between myself and the old guard. This is a theological discussion on two lines of thinking. And I try to lay out in our presentations at this camp meeting. Because I think those people don't see it. That we have been taking progressive steps over the past. We could go back 10 years or seven years or five years over the last number of years. And those first steps were gentle. People were not troubled by them. Because they didn't see what was going on. And there's one more fearful thing which you have to really get to come to terms with. It's not just that they were gentle steps. It's not just that those things took you by surprise and you didn't realize. What we had in our movement was the following. In English, they call it the elephant in the room. It was Elder Jeff. He had a cult of personality. If he spoke, it was it. No one questioned him. And since his demise, since he's left, movement. we no longer in this movement have a leader of that stature. A cult of personality that people will just listen because of who they are. And now, every step has to be won by an aggressive warfare. Everything has to be checked. Everything has to be justified. And that has meant that our message progresses slower. I'm just stating things as a fact. There's no complaint. So that's just a short summary of what we have been discussing so far and the reasons why I've introduced these topics. I want to talk about a random thought not connected directly to our study. So, we'll put it over here.
My spelling may not be correct. Homo sapien. Homo sapien. So, if I were to ask you two, parts, two words, so I, I don't tend to check the chats on these uh, when I'm presenting, but I will for this just for this moment. What language is this? Homo sapien. Okay, so some people say Greek and some people say Latin. So someone needs to adjudicate. Is it Greek or is it Latin? Okay, so everybody's piling in with Latin. Good. So it's two Latin words that come together. So, Sister Penny says, wise man. And so, I don't know if we're all okay with that definition. We'll go with that. Simple enough. So, homo. What does homo mean? Can she issue with your homo? The meaning is pretty good. Can we go with human? Or as someone said, um, Man. Nangu umwaume. And sapien. Edo na sapien. Sapien therefore means wise. Edo yana ede pivoda uamano. Distinguishing us from primates. So, I'm hoping we're all okay with that. So, the word homo means human, and the word sapien means wise. So, you have the, the man or the being that is wise compared to other creatures. So I'm hoping we're all okay with that. So here we have I put human. So this is not connected to my study. Homosexual. So we all know what homosexuals are, who they are. What language is this? Homosexual. No checking. Homosexual. <laughs> check, check. Okay, so some people have said Latin and some people have said Greek. Latin. Okay, so if homosexual is Latin, 
Then this word means human sex. And we all know that homosexual does not mean human sex. No. No, it's not Latin. Okay, so people have understood or figured out that homosexual is actually a compound or a crossword. It's a hybrid word, if I can call it that. It's composed of two languages. Greek and Latin. And in Greek, homo means what? I'm sure most of you know now. It means the same. And sex. And then you call it sex. This is Latin sexus. So the word homosexual is a hybrid word from Greek and Latin. Which basically means same sex. Good. So I just want to... Um, I think someone's already given the answer. And what, there's one more question. Where does this, where does this word come from? Homosexual. So I'll give the answer because someone's already put it on here. Like chat. So basically, the word homosexual has its origins from Germany. So I just wanted to introduce that. It has not anything to do with our study. But seeing as we're doing Hebrew and Greek 101, I thought we'd introduce it now. So, seeing as we're talking about all of these funny words that I can't pronounce, I want to give you another one. So this is another important word or concept that I think we need to um, understand. I hope my writing's not too small. It's anthropomorphism. So this word is to do with the personification of, I say, things. You can take an object. And what you do is you give it human characteristics. And it's 
anthropomorphism. So if you watch cartoons, you have these animals that can talk. Or you think about the sun or the moon having human characteristics. All of these are anthropomorphic concepts or ideas. So I'm hoping everybody understands that. Okay. Now, the reason why I introduced this word is because the Bible does. So, the question that we want to ask ourselves, or that I want to pose to you, Is about God. The question is Is God a male or female? And the reason why we ask this question is because if you go to the Bible, do I need to stop for the Portuguese? Brother Dan, you just tell me if I need to stop or I need to carry on. Do I need to stop or carry on? Can someone tell me? Okay, I'm going to carry on. Because they can't even hear my question, apparently. Okay, so in the Bible, it speaks almost exclusively about God being male or a man. And so the question is, is that factually correct? Is God male? Or maybe he's female. So what I want to suggest is that what is happening here is an anthropomorphic concept. Anthropomorphism. Uh, what we have done, humans, is that we have taken a human construct and we have projected that onto God. Or depending on how you want to see it, God created male and female and therefore he projected onto us his models explaining himself as male. And if he wants to talk to us he has to come down to our level. So that we, can ex we can understand who he is. 
So some people have said God is both male and female. And for those people who think that, I wonder if they could send me a picture of what he looks like. Like below the waist. Without being crude. Or disrespectful to God. I don't intend to be. I don't mean this disrespectfully. But I think it's a crazy idea to say God is both male and female. But in that moment, that's the better man. Okay, that we're going to go back to the same old man. We're going to stay with the man again. Or at least amusing, if not crazy. But it's it. It's another. It's that's the better. Because I thought God was spirit. I thought he created humans. Now, I'm not good at artwork particularly. But I could draw a picture of myself. We'll have a go. Here I am. Now, this was created in my image. It looks like me. But it's not me. But it's staying. It's nothing like me. For one thing, I'm three dimensional. This is two dimensional. The colors don't even match. I could get someone else to do a much better job of um, drawing me. And that would be a better creation of my image. So, all I want to say in that silly example just because we're created in God's image doesn't mean we're created in God's image. So I'm not asking what science says. I'm dealing with for those people who say the Bible says Jesus is male and I'm not going to listen to any other version or any other statement. You've not listened to the presentations that we have been doing this camp meeting. You are stuck you are in the dark ages. Under the of John. That you want to hold on to mystical ideas. Because you are uncomfortable stretching and thinking about the truth. There's no denying. There's no denial. That when Jesus was incarnated, he came on this earth as a man. But does that mean that God is male? Of course it doesn't. Such a conclusion would be based upon a false understanding of parabolic teaching. 
kanshi ukwa mpano na nguito ntoka nila ifide na leala mpana feno ugulo ndilo shu wabufi kupichida mumirumbe. When God created humankind in Genesis chapter 2, what was the message that he was sending? Was he trying to show us that male and female were different? The words themselves tell us otherwise. I'm hoping we can all recognize that. That when God creates Eve, the way it's portrayed Omo, is she different or is she the same? Omo Eva Adonduru la Bushe Adiba wa mpana nangwa ringana na dem nangwa pusana. Let's turn to Genesis. Can she tura to bedenge muktendega? We're in Genesis chapter two. Can she to the muktendeka m chapter two? Verse 20. So God creates Adam and all animal life. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. What does that mean? I want to say simply. We looked at everything. We couldn't find anything that was the same as him. I don't know how many of each animal that were created. But he saw two dogs and two cows and they looked the same. And they were friends with each other. When he looks around, he only sees one of him. One of his kind. So we know what happens. 21. 21. God puts him asleep. 22. 22. God takes a rib out of Adam, which is the same as his other ribs, and he fashions a woman. Which is the same as man, but just the first bit is missing. And then verse 23. What does Adam say? Oh, you look so different. Oh, no, Psanako. Your body shape is different to mine. No. You have a repetition. And enlarge. That Eve is exactly the same as Adam. By the way, they're not called Adam and Eve at the moment yet. Eve hasn't been given her name. So what we see in the verses is not that the, there's a difference, it's that they're the same. So people have said a mate or suitable. But the point I want us to see is he produces something 
someone that is identical to Adam, is identical to him. Bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. They are identical. They are not different. And that's the primary lesson that Genesis chapter 2 is trying to teach us. Now, of course, this issue of masculinity and femininity is going to repeat itself throughout scripture. And it's given in many different examples. We've spoken about man and woman, male, female. So, We'll give another one. The sun and the moon. The sun represents male and the moon represents female. Now, what you're going to find... Oh, we'll give another one. Before we... God... Lisa. And creation. Hello, no bumbo. So I'm going to give you three. Man, woman. Sun, moon. Woman, she hello no managashi. Sun, moon. Woman, she hello no kasuba. God, creation. Hello, Lisa, no bumbo. There are others, but we'll just go with those three. Hello, kwali bana fin bel tu asen na bofi fin fitat. These are all parables. And what God is going to do is take these three models, these three examples, and in their own different ways, they all have they all have a repeating theme. Either in their physical being or their function so let's go with the sun and the moon what's their purpose what's the purpose of the sun and the moon we don't have to guess. It tells us in Genesis chapter 1 to give light. They both are there to give light. One for the day, one for the night. But there is a substantial difference between the two. And what is the difference? When we get light from the sun, it's the originator of that light. It's the giver of light. But when it comes to the moon, it receives light. When when now pokele la ulubuto, nangu kupokele la ulubuto. Now when we start looking at these two objects, we have the giver and you have the receiver. That they both have the same function. Light. They are identical. No difference between them. It's like Adam and Eve. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. 
Nga fi afi nyefi adamu na yeva ba di umu vidi wa kwe don no So at the level of what their function is, which is to give light, they are identical. Kuninga na nga fi afi no luboto ulo ba de pera ka suba no mwenshi na vien na ba di fiesem usem. But there are subtle differences that God wants to show us. But kudi kofi mo if yo desa arefok trang nga fi akusan. And how is he going to explain the differences? He's going to portray one from a feminine perspective and one from a masculine perspective. Because he wants to show us, if I say it this way, the full spectrum of light. I, I don't mean all the rainbow. I don't mean it that way. God gives us light. And he gives that light in different ways. When it's direct, it has this masculine um, concept connected to it. When it receives to give, it has a feminine context. So, what God is trying to teach us is that he is the giver of light. And he will give the light in different ways to Hello, teach us his graciousness. You remember the story of Mount Sinai. Hold that thought. So I'll forget to mention this afterwards. I mentioned three examples. Sun, moon. Man, woman. God, creation. I'm going to do another one. I'm going to call it God and the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Has the same modeling. I'll give you four now. Go back to the story of Mount Sinai. Now God is hidden behind clouds. And the people don't even want to look at him. There's lightning and thunders. And and he's hidden behind this thing. But God gives light. Moses climbs up the mountain. And he stays there a while. And what begins to happen to Moses? When you stand in the presence of God. It's like what happens to you when you stand in the presence of the sun. You absorb that sunlight. You get a suntan. If you're lucky. Moses absorbs this light. He comes back down to, we'll call it back down to earth. Back into the valley. And now what is he going to do? He's going to start giving off this light. That's not his light. It's a reflection of God. So that is an example of two things, two models. Model one, sun and moon. Model two, 
moi ici na kasoba elo cha denga chibiri lesa edo no mpash spirit is created being good so we can see hopefully that there's consistency in this model the object is light god's people need light they get it directly from god or from his created no or from his creation and when it comes from his creation it's a reflection of god of god's light when it comes when the light comes from his creation it's a reflection of that light so what god is going to do he's going to teach us about who himself and what he's going to do is play games he's going to show you the giving and the receiving and when it's the giving he will because we're so slow he will make it known to us because you're slow of heart when it's the giving we'll put an end by it masculine when it's the receiving We'll put an F by it for female. So, let's go to man and man and woman. So, without getting too graphic about this, you can see in their physical organs one is the giver one is the receiver we know what happens um, at intercourse a man penetrates a woman he gives she receives he ejaculates he gives she receives so what we're there is the creation of life and it's all a reflection or an explanation of God. How God gives and how he receives. And it's all explained from the, we'll say, from the gender model, male, female. When we speak about God and creation, when you see God doing things, you will see him as masculine when you see god explained through creation that eagle is that a male or female eagle female the chicken the mother hen, male or female? Feminine. What you see when you start looking carefully 
Is that God is going to describe himself in masculine terms and feminine terms. When you see godliness manifest in creation, or revealed in creation, you'll see it in feministic terms. When you see God pouring out his goodness, you'll see it in masculine terms. Now, remember, the Bible is a storybook about God and his goodness. The God who gives. So it's not any wonder that the vast majority of the time you see God portrayed in the masculine. I'll probably get different answers for this question. But I'm sure hopefully someone will give me the right one eventually. Okay, what's the most important thing that we can get from God that we need? And I'm going to preface this by saying, except love, besides love. I knew it. <laughs> what's the most important thing you can get from God? Okay, I'll give you my answer. Go to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. And what you need to do is you need to search out Sophia. We all know Sophia, hopefully. This beautiful woman Go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. chapter 1. I don't think it's the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. Verse 20. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She cries in the chief place of concourse, in the opening of the gates, in the city, in the, sorry, in the city, she uttereth her words, saying. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Those delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and I and would none of my reproof. Then she starts laughing at you. When you carry on through the verses. So this is Sophia. You can go and study her if you like. 
She's obviously female. Who is she? I would suggest she is information. Words. You might call it logos. You might call it the word. You might call it Jesus. We don't have time to go into this to prove what I'm saying. But wisdom is these words. What Sophia speaks to you. The words, the word. Logos. Logos. Who is the word? Jesus. And yet people tell me that Jesus is a man. And it's clear from inspiration that Jesus is female. So we need to be really careful about how we read. And not make rash judgments or statements. When the Bible speaks about a masculine God, it's not because God is male. By the way, changing subjects. What's the problem with Hebrew? I'm not a Hebrew expert. You have to tell me, what's the problem with the Hebrew language? So the problem with... No, it's not... No, it's not complicated. The problem with Hebrew, it's simple. That's the problem. What's the advantage with Greek? Why is Greek good? Because it's complicated, good. What's the problem with Hebrew? It's too simple. Now, if you want to describe something in Hebrew, you've got two choices. What are they? It's on the board. Male or female? You don't, you don't have anything in between. I can't I can't say it. Not not with it. With the pencil. pencil. In Greek, I can. In Greek, I can make this non-gender. In Hebrew, because it's, it's a basic language, it doesn't let you do that. Now, I say, I'm not a Hebrew or Greek scholar. So I'm only explaining things in a simple way, but I think it's accurate. In Hebrew, it's not Hebrew. If you talk about anything, you have to give it gender. Male or female, you don't have a choice. So you can see how difficult it is for God. I don't know why he chose Hebrew. But he's stuck that 
everything's going to have gender to it. Pandu kulinga na fena vo tsiri mo tsiye be tsena tsifiro kwa ta fe bo tsiye mo me na ngoma na ka. Now remember. Le do ibukshen. That God is trying to teach us about Himself. Atilesa alefo kutfunda palua ko. The giver. Odi niga pera. Is masculine. Odi mo me. He's also a receiver. Or he has agents who receive to give. Like wheat. Wheat is going to receive sunlight, absorb it, and give you something. So all of these concepts are going to be compartmentalized into masculine and feminine terms. It's not because God has gender. He's not male and female. He's neither. It's not because men are superior to women. What did Adam do? In Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 2. He gave of himself. So therefore he's going to be defined in masculine terms. Eve is going to receive the bone. So she's going to be Man, the feminine version. Woman. It's not because there's some hierarchy between them. It's just to explain to us the two facets of God. How he thinks, how he operates. He gives and receives. And we see this over and over again. So when we start thinking about God, and we start thinking about the Father and the Son, you can begin to see how incorrect it is to believe the following. That God is a father and that Jesus is a son. In the book of Proverbs, Jesus isn't even born yet. He's the Logos, the word. And his name is Sophia. Woman. Feminine. Why? Because in heaven, what was Jesus doing? Was he standing equal with his We'll call it, I, I, I don't know what to say, equal to his father, or we'll just say equal to God. No, he stands as a servant. You remember Elder Tess, in her first presentation, discussed this dynamic. This is one of the things we have really to be thankful for, for the spirit of prophecy. As she explains the nature of Jesus. Not that he's a man. But what? What is he in heaven? What's he doing? He's receiving from God. 
And giving those blessings to people. The angels. And so he has this feminine characteristic. That's why he's called Sophia in the book of Proverbs. Because it's an aspect of God. It's not a separate God. It's an aspect of God. It's explained in a different way. And it's done that, it's given feminine characteristics so we can learn better. You know, what's so crazy about human beings is that almost every gift, every tool that God has given to us, we have abused. The ceremonial system. Human relationships. Animals. Panama. Plant life. Anything and everything. All of those things are meant to teach us and we destroy those models. Now we've run out of time. But I want to leave you with this closing thought. What happens every 24 hours? What marks a new day? Good. So everybody fell into my trap except one or two people. People have said sunrise and sunset. Now, of course, we know that that is completely wrong. Because we are going back over a thousand years into the dark ages of Catholicism to say sunset. We do know that the sun never sets, don't we? And you do know that the sun never rises. The sun stands still. And we move around. This is not a sunrise or a sunset. So This is an earth rotation and one person got it. Now, we're smiling. And I want to know, why are you smiling? Because the last time someone mentioned this subject, they did so at the peril of their life. Who was that? You're all typing. Good, excellent. Galileo. He risked his life to say there is no such thing as sunset. And I want us to think about that. Because it even though it's just a random thought. It relates directly to our subject. Dogma that's been taught for a thousand years. Time does not make it truth. I want us to remember that as we move through our studies.
Not just at this camp, but moving forward. Remember, this anthropomorphic concept that God has given to us. He portrays himself as masculine and feminine. Because he created us that way. To teach us about who he is and how he operates. The giver God and the receiver God. Now when I say the receiver God, I don't mean he wants things from you. It's all giving. He either gives directly or he gives indirectly. And this is the masculine and feminine concept the inspiration wants to teach us. So I've answered the question someone asked, who does he, um, from whom does God receive? That's not the concept. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. I can only give you what I receive from the Father. What do crazy people believe that means? They think it means Jesus is a lesser being, a lesser God, doesn't have power. That's why it's crazy. The great controversy is all centered around the divinity of Jesus. He is verily God. And yet, he says, I can't do anything unless I receive it. Because he wants to teach us how God operates. He gives directly and he gives through his agents and it gets so involved that one of his agents actually is Jesus who is God. Ezekiel would call this wheels within wheels. The whole concept of man and woman, masculine, feminine, it's not about headship or who is superior or who is inferior. It's about how God interacts with his create with his creation. And when you see these two ways that God deals with his creation, the best way that he could explain it is by making those two humans one that gave, one that received. And in the example of human beings, that modeling is done physically. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you.
We thank you for our humanity. And we thank you for your divinity. As humanity and divinity combine. Help us to understand the parables of the masculine and the feminine. Help us to see your goodness and your wisdom. Help us to embrace the wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs. She stands outside crying to be heard. May each of us be willing to open our hearts and receive her. Bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're coming back in 15 minutes, uh, but we're going to be closing the room just for five minutes and then we come back.